we are very far from free speech at this university. Even though we celebrate the free speech movement, the moment you call it the free speech movement with capital letters, you put it in the past as something that we are proud and happy about. But in the present, there is no such thing as free speech. You're not allowed to ask many questions and you're not allowed to say many things. And if you do, you get into serious trouble. Uh, in my case, I was pushed out of the university at least three times every time I fought back and we managed to keep my job. But uh, it's been very difficult. And I am just one of many examples where people are punished by what they say or what they research. People who have political uh, grudges against me are in positions of power within the scientific establishment. And they make it very difficult to publish, especially publish in places where my ideas would be of some influence. But, you know, that's a limitation that is not very great. Most of the limitations, I think, for scientists are limitations of the consciousness of the scientist. Um, and they, are, they come in the form of self-censorship. You censor yourself because you're afraid of what could happen to you, because you're afraid that you could lose your funding, you're afraid that you could lose your possibilities of publishing, your status with regards to your colleagues and so on. But um, I am grateful that there is this protection around my position right now. After so many years of battle, I feel that I have this freedom and I really intend to use it as much as possible. such a peaceful place and also such a mineral place you know this was full of ice this was ice not too long ago a few thousand years ago which is nothing and life is only coming now on top of the rock this is really life just being created being the, the beginnings of many things so it's been a good place for me as a refugee from the battles in the south um, to come and think and reflect and write and start new projects and uh, be with people who want to hear what you say instead of being always discomforted by what you have to say. So um, I was very, very thankful and very happy when the opportunity came of coming here and uh, have this time for reflection. It's difficult it is impossible to find a place like this anywhere else in the world. This is really a unique place because this is the one place where there is independence from monies and influence from the industry, from the biotech industry, and where people are not committed to that agenda. Distrust me if I tell you that I'm unbiased. Distrust me if I tell you that I'm objective. I am biased. I am dependent. I am, I have links. I have commitments. There's two very important concepts, conflict of interest and conflict of commitment. Conflict of interest, you, most of your countries have ways of dealing with them where you can show to a certain degree that somebody's getting actual just money from something that they're doing. That's called conflict of interest. Conflict of commitment is much more difficult to, to find and very, very difficult to deal with, if at all, once the structure of the scientific and academic and regulatory system of knowledge making has broken down. We're going through an incredible meltdown of that system right now. And you, as much as I, as much as anybody in the, in the world, are confronted with the meltdown of that system that used to be able to tell us when somebody was in conflict of interest and in conflict of commitment. So distrust me. 
Whenever I stand in front of you, ask me, who are you? My name, this is what uh, Master Travik always asks every morning, whenever he shows up in the morning, and this is true. He says, who are you? He doesn't ask, how are you? He says, who are you? And I think you should ask of every presenter who comes in front of you, especially as representatives of the public. If that's the first question you should ask. And then from that answer, you might start judging the person and therefore the conflict of interest, the conflict of commitment. Genuk is short for Institute of Gene Ecology. So we made a new uh, science, which we called Gene Ecology which is based on the knowledge that the, all the genetic material, all the hereditary material of this world is influenced by the environment that this hereditary material is within. Because of this holistic approach, it is necessary to include also social sciences, political scientists, social economics, cultural uh, sciences, indigenous people's rights, legal issues and so on and so forth and then try to melt this together my aim coming here is to share experience with people here and being involved in a network at worldwide level on this issue of gmos because we also have concern in africa about this issue and we are working on different things on biosafety but also to give some uh, uh, assessments at different level because also our country is working on by safety uh, by safety laws we are self sufficient in food production in most of the African countries our local seeds are very very interesting in terms of enhancing the yield because they are very very clean in most of the cases and there is pot potential also to enhance the yield of this local seed why don't we work on that instead of uh, uh, calling for genetic engineering yeah. We are attacked for not being neutral and balanced and objective and all this. It's simply not the job of a biosafety scientist to be objective and neutral. It is our job to make scientifically based worst case scenarios, turn them into hypotheses, turn them into experiments, and then have the hypothesis uh, strengthened or dismissed. That is the assignment we have from the society. So objectivity and neutrality and so on doesn't have any meaning in this context. One of the reasons why we are lining up now, making a kind of scientist movement, is of course to protect ourselves against the attacks which will continue to come, of course, because we are obviously threatening to the markets of uh, the producers of genetically modified organisms and other genetically engineered products. Beautiful. It is very true that the power that technocrats and experts have developed in these years is so large and so out of control that it has become much more of a religion and it's a religion that has many dogmas and one of those dogmas is that humans have the power to change nature the way they want it's complete hubris because we can't we are manipulating life in a way that we really do not understand we cannot control and then we're letting it go into the environment. Uh, so it's a change that is radical, that is unprecedented, that is um, beyond anything we can understand, and it's unretrievable. We cannot get it back. That's my concern.
always said, you'll only defend that which you love. So people say, what should I do? How shall I defend the environment? Go out and fall in love with it. Fall in love with the river. Fall in love with the farm. Fall in love with a species. Just fall in love with something. Believe me, when you do, then you'll defend it. So if you pick up almost any rock in this river, you'll see small caddis worms. These are the earliest form of caddis as they come around. Uh, caddis flies are the primary food source for the trout in this river. Uh, Indiana University discovered that Bt corn, this is this genetically modified corn, the Bt in it, which is a, a pesticide, uh, kills these insects. When it comes into the river, it destroys them at this stage, it restricts their growth, and is, is a major problem we're going to have in rivers like this that are surrounded by Bt cotton because that Bt will come in and kill these caddis flies. That was just reported uh, in 2007, and immediately the industry came in and started attacking these, those researchers again. Uh, so here we have GMOs with a result that people had not expected. Ten years after it's been introduced, we finally find out that it can be a serious threat to rivers like this. So much of uh, what we see with biotechnology and these modern technologies are linear. It's the idea that somehow we're in a linear progress towards some technological future. But the salmon teach us a very different lesson. They teach us that it's not a linear line up. It's a circle, a life-giving circle. And they come back to the very spot where they were born, and that is where they spawn and die, and the young come out again. It's a beautiful cycle. Uh, so they teach us a new way of thinking about our lives and our economy. How can we have a sustainable, life-giving economy rather than a linear one that is always about more and more production no matter what the cost to nature or ourselves? You know, everything that we see here, our clothes, the camera, my fly rod, it's all made from the earth. There is only one economy, and that's the economy we see around us right now. You know, the other economy of capital and technology industry, that's all made up. That's all made up in our heads. And the whole stock market, all of that's made up. The real economy is ecology. And I think what the biotechnology industry doesn't understand and what so many other people don't understand is we now need to evolve and say that if we're going to have a sustainable economy, it is going to be enmeshed, embedded in this ecology. It's going to have to follow the laws of this nature and not the artificial laws of any technology, including biotechnology.